Hello, everyone. Hi, I just want to welcome you to the Freedman Seminar Series. Um, and uh, this is our second part of our three-part series on guidelines. Uh, two weeks ago, we had Frank uh, Hugh to talk about the dietary guidelines for Americans. We're going to have uh, Russell Pate talk about the physical fitness uh, guidelines. And then a couple of weeks later, we're going to have a panel discussion across these. So without further ado, I'd like for Chris Economos to come up to introduce our speaker. Hi, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing a colleague and friend that I've actually known for over 20 years. So I want to do a little bit of a formal introduction and then a little bit of a personal one. So Russ Tate is a professor in the Department of Exercise Science in the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina. Russ is an exercise physiologist with interest in physical activity and physical fitness in children and the health implications of physical activity. He's published more than 350 scholarly papers and has authored or edited eight books. His work has been supported by the NIH, the CDC, the American Heart Association, lots of different foundations. And what I think you'll find really interesting and what he'll be talking about today is his uh, participation in the U.S. Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee. There have only been two, and he has served on both of them. And he was also a member of the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee in 2003 and 2004. And I know you heard Dr. Hu and you've heard Alice and others speak about their experiences. This was when physical activity made its way into the guidelines, which was really important. So Russ has served many, many roles nationally. Really, he's an international expert on physical activity and the person that many of us go to when we're looking for good advice and the latest information on physical activity. And my experience with Russ started right after I finished my PhD when Tufts took part in a really big initiative that set together a group of people to write some papers on the landscape of physical activity and nutrition. And I was part of a working group with Russ that resulted in a paper that's been very well cited that was a little bit unique. What we set out to do was study other models of social change or other movements that have been realized in the U.S., for example, breastfeeding and seatbelt use and recycling, to see what we could learn from those social movements to apply them to physical activity and nutrition. And it was significant because the paper was really important, but also because it informed the way that I conducted Shape Up Somerville, which was a large research study that I led here in Massachusetts that went on to influence my career. So it was a really important uh, role that that paper played, not only in the field at large, but in the way that I thought about approaching problems and doing my science. So I tell that story because it happened right after I finished my doctorate and it was something that was really career changing for me and I'm grateful to you, Russ. And recently I've been able to serve with Russ at the National Academies of Sciences on the round table for obesity solutions where he's been the vice chair for the past six years and I was able to just take over as he uh, stepped away as the vice chair. So we've had a long, um, many, many years of knowing each other and I just want to thank you for all the advice you've given and the example you've set and really the contributions you've made internationally to put physical activity on the map. So we welcome you here today and thank you for being with us. You probably, you probably need it higher. Oh, I've got, I've got, oh, okay. got, Great. got a mobile here. Right. <laughs> well, thank you, Chris. <coughs> As you can tell, Chris and I go way back. Um, I was going to say she was in middle school, but she, she, told, she told the truth there. I was trying to let her off the hook, but uh, uh, I, I, I'm privileged to be here, honored to have been invited, and uh, I, I've had some great friends and colleagues here at Tufts over the years, and it really is a, a thrill to be here, and uh, thank you for coming today. Um, you can tell from my, uh, from my title that uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is what I think we need taking. Um, what I think we need to do in this country to um, increase the physical activity level of the, of, of the population. Uh, and I am going to get to that here shortly. And I'm going to get there, as Chris suggested, uh, sort of uh, through a, uh, an overview of the, uh, 
recently released second iteration of the Federal Physical Activity Guidelines, but before I launch into all that, uh, let me tell you what I'm not going to do. Um, I'm not going to spend much time trying to convince you that physical activity is important to human health. Um, I think you know that. If you don't, you're uh, an outlier in this society, because I, I, I'm, I'm not sure the physical activity public health field has, has hit a lot of home runs yet, but one that we have hit is uh, I do think we've educated the population that physical activity is important to health. So I think you're pretty hard pressed to find somebody that doesn't fundamentally know that. So I'm not going to take time to try to convince you because I think you probably already believe it. Uh, second, I'm not going to spend much time today trying to convince you that uh, increasing physical activity in the U.S. population is uh, one of the most important public health challenges that we have right now. Uh, I think it is. Um, I'm assuming that most of you may believe that at some level, but probably don't believe it at the level I do. Uh, and I think if I had enough time to talk to you about it and lay out the case and the data, uh, I, I think I could change some of your viewpoints on that. Uh, <clears throat> but I don't have time to do that today. So uh, I'm going to base my comments on, number one, the assumption that you believe physical activity is important to human health. And number two, you're at least open to the idea that it would be important for us to increase the physical activity level <coughs> of the U.S. population. And so that's, that's where I'm heading. I'm going to do fundamentally two things. I'm going to set some context, and uh, most of my comments there uh, are going to involve an overview of uh, the 2018, but it was late 2018, uh, really less than a year ago. Uh, recently released the uh, second iteration of the U.S. Uh, Federal Physical Activity Guidelines. And uh, then I'm going to tell you what I, what I think we ought to do about helping a lot more Americans meet those guidelines than currently do. A little quick history to start with. Uh, the idea that we should be communicating um, with the public about physical activity is hardly new. Uh, this goes back to the great Greek scholars, Hippocrates, walking is man's best medicine. There's a, you know, there are chapters of these. <laughs> we can find lots of uh, quotes like this from, from early scholars, uh, early Americans included. Um, I don't think there was a whole lot of uh, what we would today call scientific evidence to support their positions. I think it was a function of their personal experience, their life experience. The idea that we need to communicate with the public about physical activity is hardly new. <clears throat> but until fairly recently, most of that communicating was being done by celebrity experts. Right? So one from my youth that some in the room probably remember, a woman named Bonnie Pruden. Bonnie Pruden actually uh, was involved in some science, but uh, you know, she made her she made her name really as a public spokesperson for the importance of physical activity and, and fitness. Wrote 15 books and uh, made the cover of Sports Illustrated early in the Sports Illustrated's uh, publication run, and uh, was a very very well known person in uh, in American society for a long time in the probably 50s and, and 60s. Uh, Bill Bowerman, who I um, had the great uh, honor to cross paths with uh, when I was a graduate student at the University of Oregon, best known famous track coach, but uh, he had a sabbatical. And, and, and I, I will say that uh, this was in the days when uh, a lot of coaches, particularly in the non-revenue sports, were also faculty members, and Bowerman was very proud of the fact that he was a full professor at, uh, at the University of Oregon. Took a sabbatical, went to New Zealand, and found a whole bunch of people running who were not competitive athletes. And he came back, wrote a book called Jogging, which sold about a zillion copies in the, in the 1960s, and he became a spokesperson for physical activity for, <coughs> for health and fitness. Uh, Ken Cooper, who's still very active, came along in the late 60s, wrote a book called Aerobics. Um, he's an Air Force cardiologist that started a research center 
uh, in, uh, in Dallas that's still uh, very active. And um, uh, published in that first book something called the Aerobics Point System, which uh, if you go to the library and dig it out and take a look at it, you will find is frighteningly close to what we currently recommend <laughs> through now federal physical activity guidelines. So the guy had a pretty good idea and was looking very far off from what in the intervening decades research has pointed us to. In the early 70s, the American College of Sports Medicine, which is uh, sort of the lead scientific uh, professional society for um, exercise science in the U.S., began producing uh, what were really clinical guidelines on physical activity. Um, and um, you know, they evolved a little bit you know, over five-year revision cycles, and it's still on a five-year revision cycle. This is the first four cycles. And uh, <clears throat> when this first came out, the recommended uh, sort of approach to, uh, to exercise was uh, to aerobic activity, three to five days per week, 20 to 45 minutes in duration, 70 to 90 percent of functional capacity. Now, there are probably a few people in this room that know what 70 to 90 percent of functional capacity means, but a lot of you probably don't. That's damned intense exercise, okay? Not many people in this room would be able to do that for very long. You do it for a little while. Uh, but that says something about where we, where we were when we started thinking about how to communicate with the public about, about physical activity for health. So the guidelines evolved a little bit there in the first few cycles, and you can see that by 1991, most of that recommendation was the same, except for the intensity which had now drifted down to a very wide range of 40 to 85 percent. Now, I can tell you most people in this room would be able to do 40 percent of functional capacity for quite a long while, probably be fairly comfortable doing it. So the field's impressions about what we should be recommending to the public for uh, physical activity exercise for health uh, clearly evolved a good bit during that 15 to 20 year period. That's where things laid until the uh, until the mid '90s, and, and I had you know timing is everything. I happened to be standing in the right place at the right time when somebody needed to get this done, and uh, so I did have the opportunity to work with uh, some great people on the development of um, you know I guess maybe at least by label was the first public health oriented. Uh, physical activity recommendation, and it was a collaboration between the CDC and the American College of Sports Medicine. And um, you know, we had people in the room that I thought, you know, certainly brought a lot of technical expertise about exercise and, and health outcomes associated with it. It was epidemiologists and physiologists. There was not a single health communication expert in the room. I can tell you. <laughs> And I, you know, I don't know whether we got it right or not, but I will tell you that when we came together for two days to figure out what to put in this paper, um, I, you know, I think we already knew coming in what the substance of the content of the of the recommendation should be. Um, but we spent the better part of two days figuring out how to produce that phrase. Right? How, to, how how were we going to craft, you know, a, a public health message around physical activity. So I thought, okay, no pride of ownership here. I don't know whether we got this right or wrong or awful, but it read every U.S. adult should accumulate 30 minutes or more of moderate intensity physical activity on most preferably all days of the week. Now I can tell you that the analogous recommendations, I'm going to show you some of this, have only gotten longer, wordier, and more complicated over time. And I just think there is a debate about is that really the smartest way to try to talk to the public about this, but I won't tell. Um, so once the adult guideline got out there in that form, uh, folks that uh, work with kids started thinking about the need for something analogous to that. And the group in the UK got there first, uh, pulled together a group um, that uh, <coughs> issued what was intended to be a somewhat analogous public health recommendation on physical activity for kids. And it read all children and youth could participate in physical activity that is of at least moderate intensity for an average of one hour a day. 
So since I was in the room, I think I can tell you where the one hour came from, and we backed into it. There were data that people were using accelerometry as an objective measure of physical activity in kids. And the, you know, really the default was the adult guideline, 30 minutes. So the question is, well, why not 30? You know, if that's good for adults, why not kids? And the answer was there were data showing that 30 minutes uh, was not enough uh, to, to uh, avoid excessive weight and uh, you know, adiposity. And so there, there was a sense that it probably need for kids probably needed to be more than 30 minutes. Um, this adult, uh, this child 60 minute guideline has stood the test of time. I'll say more about it in a little bit here. But, um, you know, I, I, I wish I could tell you that there was this mountain of you know, scientific evidence pointing to the 60 minute recommendation, um, not exactly the way this uh, played out. So, again, there was a, you know, about a decade there, and uh, then the uh, first iteration of the Federal Physical Activity Guidelines came along. Now, Chris mentioned that you know, I was honored to serve on the Dietary Guidelines Committee earlier than this, and uh, many of you probably know that there is a, uh, there's a law, congressional mandate, that there will be dietary guidelines produced on a five-year revision cycle. And, um, you know, that comes with funding to pay for the process. Uh, despite the fact that we have uh, pushed for quite a long while now to uh, get a law, a congressional mandate that there will be physical activity guidelines, we've not yet succeeded. That bill's recently been reintroduced, I'll mention. Um, but it happened in, uh, <clears throat> in advance of 2008, despite the fact that there was not a law, because uh, Penny Slade Sawyer, who was uh, a good friend of George W. Bush, was in a leadership position with the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. He prevailed upon Bush to say, hey, I think there's a legacy thing here. Bush leaned on Mike Levitt, who was the Secretary of Health and Human Services, to find the money to pay for it, and that produced a mad scramble because this was all getting toward the end of the, uh, the Bush uh, presidency. Uh, but it happened. It happened, and and um, you know the protocol <coughs> for the dietary guidelines was there, and there were you know decades of experience with it. Um, and so basically it was brought forward and applied in, in the development of these physical activity guidelines uh, uh, in preparation for this 2008 release. So I take the time to tell you that story for where this thing came from because I do think it's important for you to know that data are wonderful and <laughs> we need all of it we can get and the science is critical. And I don't think, frankly, this would have happened if there wasn't lots of scientific evidence to support it. Whether these policies happen or not, so often is a function of who's there in a particular position, open to a particular idea, and positioned well enough to be able to advocate to uh, decision makers. So data are wonderful, but it's not the whole story when it comes to advancing uh, public policy. So <coughs> that brings us up to... Um, a few months ago, and the release of the second iteration of the physical activity guidelines for Americans. I guess you had must have had a talk recently about the dietary guidelines, and uh, the process is uh, uh, for the physical activity guidelines is very similar. Uh, it starts with the creation of a, a federal a FACA, a federal advisory committee, um, and uh, you know there, there's an announcement in the federal uh, uh, register that invites nominations and volunteers and so on, people that might want to serve on the committee. Uh, the, um, unlike the dietary guidelines, the physical activity guidelines are entirely under the Department of Health and Human Services. The dietary guidelines are sort of a partnership between USDA and <coughs> Health and Human Services. That's not the case for physical activity. So the, um, you know, the in-house staff uh, in the, in the uh, Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, Department of Health and Human Services, identify a committee. Uh, the committee membership, I think, is pretty clearly selected on the basis of some sense of what 
the key scientific issues are that will need to be addressed in, uh, uh, in, in, in the report. Uh, the committee is impaneled, uh, has a series of public meetings. Uh, the guideline is that half or more of the committee is going to meet. It's got to be public. It doesn't have to be in person. But if it's going to be on the phone, then it's got to be announced in, in advance, and the public has to be able to listen in and so on. Um, in addition to those public meetings, there is an endless stream of conference calls you know, with smaller committees and panels, and I'll tell you a little more about that in a bit. Um, eventually, the, um, um, the, the, a, a report is developed. That report is provided to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, you know, that person accepts it. It gets passed over to the staff in the Department of Health and Human Services. And it's that in-house uh, professional staff that develops the actual guidelines that go out to the public. So the committee is, you know, is, is a bunch of scientists for the most part that, that summarize the scientific evidence in selected areas. And um, the, the staff in HHS take that report and mold it into uh, a set of recommendations for the, for the public. And eventually that is uh, rolled out to the public, and then there are a bunch of ancillary materials that are produced along with it. Um, this is the list of subcommittees that were formed, um, and it pretty well tells the story about the topics or subtopics that, that were seen as um, important. And uh, some of these are not too different than the way the committees were laid out uh, for, the, for the 2008 guidelines, but some of them are different. Uh, there was a committee on uh, subcommittee on sedentary behavior this time, one on uh, brain health that was not there the previous time around. So these things evolved based on, on, the, on the available science and emerging issues. So some things really did not change very much between the 2008 federal guidelines <coughs> and the 2018 guidelines. One of those was the, the core physical activity recommendation for adults. It was then and is now 150 to 300 minutes of at least moderate intensity physical activity. If the intensity is vigorous, then the time can be less, or it's a sliding scale between the two. Um, and the core is uh, aerobic activity distributed preferably throughout the week. Uh, with resistance exercise performed at least three days a week. Now, um, I hope most of you pretty well had a feel for that. You know, there, there are people in my, in my business that get real energized about whether the public can recite the guideline or not. I personally think give a flip, okay? I, what I want is people to have the right sense, you know, of what, what, you know, what's appropriate physical activity for health, I think. A lot of people have this, okay? Um, it's also true that the core guideline for kids didn't change, at least for school-age kids. It uh, was and is uh, 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity uh, per day. Vigorous intensity included at least three days a week. Same for muscle strengthening and bone strengthening uh, activities as well. So again, that really didn't change. So what did change? You know, there, I think there were some important things that, that are in the new guidelines that were not there in 2008. One thing is the list of documented health benefits associated with uh, maintaining uh, regular physical activity got longer and more diverse. And one element here that I'm going to draw your attention to because I'm glad it got some attention uh, this time around. I hope it gets a lot more attention in the future, and that is the short-term benefits of physical activity. I'm going to have to digress here for just a minute to do a little amateur behavioral science for you. <coughs> uh, physical activity has gotten at the table in public health and, and medicine, I think largely because of the compelling evidence that higher levels of physical activity reduce risk for future development of, of a fairly long and important list of non-communicable diseases. So 
of its heart disease and type 2 diabetes, and, um, you know, osteoporosis and colon cancer and so on. Now, that's important that we know that. Um, but if you're 20 years old, like some of you are, uh, is that really going to motivate you to get up tomorrow morning and go out and be physically active? I think the answer often is maybe, probably not. <laughs> so what would? And I think it's uh, likely to be recent experience that you found to be positive with physical activity. So uh, you liked how you felt when you did it. You liked who you did it with. You liked where you did it. You liked the activity that you engaged in. Uh, a lot of different reasons why people you know, have a positive experience with physical activity. And I think people who are going to be physically active tomorrow are very likely to be the people that had a positive experience with it today. So, or they're people who maybe have been able to discipline themselves to be active for a while, a few days, a few weeks, um, and they experience some positive outcomes fairly quickly. Okay. So I'm hopeful that this short-term benefits list over there on the left gets a lot more attention in the future because, um, you know, frankly, we don't want to do all this work again <laughs> without some payoff, right? We want more people to be more active, and I think we've got to try to tweak these guidelines and the whole process in a direction that is, is more tuned into what are we trying to get done here, okay? Uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, an academic, uh, you know, experience where, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, just sign, uh, summarizing the scientific evidence. Um, another new, new thing that uh, I'll have to say here, I've worked hard on and glad that it got in, um, is uh, a guideline for, for kids uh, ages three to five. Now, when we did this in 2008, there just really was not enough evidence to support uh, any recommendation for young kids. This time there was, um, and um, it was, it, 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 it's, the language here is a little squishy, and, but I think it was probably what it needed to be. Uh, so I haven't uh, argued too much with my friends in Health and Human Services about the language here. It says preschool age kids should be physically active throughout the day to enhance growth and development. Adult caregivers of preschool age children should encourage active play that includes a variety of activity types. There's additional language that alludes to um, <clears throat> 300 minutes of total physical activity. That includes light, moderate, and vigorous. Um, that's around the median for what you see in preschool age kids. And so, um, and, and Love, love our friends in Australia and Canada and the UK. They're, they're, they're out there pushing hard on 300 minutes, which I don't really argue with, uh, but truly the data probably don't just point right at 300 minutes as, as uh, you, know, um, you know, the uh, important threshold. Um, I was telling Roger this morning about this. Uh, you know, we had, to, we had to sort of strike a balance. I mean, uh, Again, our friends in Australia and Canada are out there on sedentary behavior, and um, frankly, we didn't want to come across as uh, a little clueless, so we felt like we had to figure out a way to, to deal with the, the emerging evidence on sedentary behavior and, uh, and, and, and health risk. Um, but honestly, the scientific evidence is not nearly as far advanced yet. For, for that as it is for physical activity. And of course, we were impaneled to do the physical activity guidelines, not the sedentary behavior guidelines. So we had a, we had a balance to strike, and the way we struck it was to, to focus on the interactions between sedentary behavior and physical activity as associated with health, health outcomes. Paul Eklund in uh, Cambridge was uh, already well known before. He's famous now because we basically took one of his huge studies and worked with the data uh, to create this heat diagram, and we went through about 30 different iterations of this thing, so hope you like it. Um, but it essentially shows the, the interactive relationship between physical activity and sedentary behavior. 
what it basically says is if you're looking to minimize non-communicable disease risk, um, if you're meeting the physical activity guideline, you may not need to worry too much about how much time you're spending sitting. But if you're not very active, you need to be quite worried about how much time you're spending sitting. So it, it's an interactive relationship. Uh, do we need to learn a lot more about these, these interactions and relationships? Absolutely. And my guess is there'll be a more <coughs> sophisticated treatment of all this um, in, in 10 years when the next iteration of the guidelines comes out. Another balance that we tried to strike was between putting out a public health guideline, which is sort of a specific target, and yet at the same time speaking to the masses of people who do very little physical activity, that it would be very beneficial for you to do some. Okay? And so there was an effort to, you know, in the, in the report and in doing recommendations to, on the one hand, say it would be really good for you to be out here, but if you're currently over there, clearly there's a whole lot of benefit in kind of getting this far, right? So, you know, I know there are people in the room that <coughs> know a lot about health communication. That's not a real easy thing <laughs> to get through the screen uh, and the mass media out to the average person, but it's, it's, it's really what the science says. So, um, you know, some of us have argued that, um, you know, maybe the best way to speak to the public is just do more, <laughs> be more active. Because aside from triathletes, uh, you know, that recommendation is probably okay for very large percentage of the population. But we've, we've certainly got more to learn about how to, how to do this. Uh, I mentioned that brain health was a focus this time around. And, uh, you know, I, I refer that section of the report and the, and the guidelines to you. But, um, you know, again, I think there's, there's rapidly developing scientific evidence that points to the idea that, um, you know, there, there, there are real benefits to higher levels of physical activity uh, for various manifestations of brain health, all the way from dementia to uh, academic performance in elementary school. So there is a, a lot of uh, emerging science there. Uh, there was a lot of focus this time on adults with chronic conditions, which is one heck of a lot of people <laughs> in, in this society. And so it was not, uh, the focus was not just physical activity cure X. <laughs> it was on what are the health effects of physical activity on persons with X. And, and, and of course, for a very large number of older people in this country, it's not just X, it's X, Y, and Z. So it's combinations of chronic conditions. And there's a, a quite, I think, robust and growing body of scientific evidence showing uh, very important health benefits in persons with multiple uh, chronic conditions. Um, I think, uh, you know, maybe historically the, the biggest breakthrough in the guidelines process this time was the inclusion of a chapter in the report and a, and a subcommittee on interventions to increase physical activity. So I, I pretty vividly remember um, serving on the Dietary Guidelines Committee and being told quite regularly, get, get back between the white lines. <laughs> the, the, you know, your job is study the relationship between these, you know, these dietary factors and, and health outcomes. And then, frankly, that same approach was adopted in the 2008 Physical Activity Guidelines. It's your job is not to tell people how to be more active or how to eat better. It's just let's focus on um, those uh, relationships. Now well, that, that wall broke down this time and uh, there was a decision to include a chapter on interventions and uh, Abby King and colleagues uh, I think bid off more than any small group of humans could possibly uh, you know, swallow, but uh, uh, they, were, they worked very hard to summarize that, that huge uh, uh, intervention literature. And um, again, I commend them for the work, and I recommend that you take a look at that if you're interested. So um, those are some new things about the 2018 guidelines. 
Also, a lot of materials were released by the Department of Health and Human Services that, that sort of were intended to translate um, that, all that science, not only for the public, but for professional groups. And that brings us to what we're going to do about all that. So, um, you know, for over a decade, I've been you know, just in the interest of being honest here, uh, I put a lot of professional effort into uh, the National Physical Activity Plan. And uh, what that is, is a comprehensive set of strategies, including policies, practices, and initiatives that are aimed at increasing physical activity in all segments of the population. Um, the uh, first iteration of the National Physical Activity Plan was directly connected to the 2008 Federal Physical Activity Guidelines. And it was funded by CDC uh, by some folks who recognized that the guidelines alone were not going to be enough to get the job. Okay. We got a long history uh, of finger wagging and saying, this is how much physical activity you need to do. Get out there and do it. What's wrong with you? Right? And uh, that'll get you about 10%. You know, I mean, there, there, there really are people that you know, hear it, internalize it, act on it. They're great at, at you know, managing their own behavior. And they're, you know, they, they, they buy the science, they know it's important, and they do it. Um, but there are about 90% of people that that doesn't work for it very well. And so there was a pretty clear sense that it, the guidelines were important, but it was going to take more than that. And uh, part of what was needed was a comprehensive strategic plan for uh, <coughs> increasing activity in, in the U.S. population. So I'm going to give you a short history of this thing, and then I'm going to tell you about some elements of it that I think are particularly important. So this all started in 2007 with some funding from CDC. Uh, we formed a small coordinating committee, um, invited a bunch of representatives from uh, for the most part, uh, large national not-for-profit health organizations. A bunch of them chipped in some money, formed an informal coordinating committee, hosted a national meeting in D.C., and uh, in 2010 released the first uh, comprehensive national physical activity plan. At that point, there was no idea what was going to happen next because it had been just a mad scramble to produce the first plan. Uh, we went a year or two trying to figure out whether anybody else was going to sustain this thing, decided that they weren't, and so we formed the 501c3 National Physical Activity Plan Alliance that exists for the purpose of, of sustaining and promoting the application of the national plan. We had a second national meeting in 2016 that released a thoroughly updated uh, <coughs> uh, national plan. Uh, this is the logos of uh, the organizations that have provided uh, support and leadership and uh, serve on the board of directors for this organization. A fairly diverse group. I mean, you see, you see some very large not-for-profit health organizations, you know, heart, cancer, diabetes, and so on. And there's some that are, that are kind of much more specific to the physical activity world. Um, but it's, a, it's been a functional quite diverse group that has come together to do this. Um, this thing is developed, as I say, from really an informal coalition to uh, a formal 501c3. Uh, the mission of this relatively new organization is to maintain and expand the impact of the National Physical Activity Plan, and that's what it's been doing for the last several years. And uh, that brings us to the current iteration of the National Physical Activity Plan, which is organized around nine societal sectors. Uh, you, you, know, you could organize something like this around population subgroups and so on. Long story how we got to this, but we were trying to think about application, who would, who would actually act on the strategies and tactics in the plan and decided that maybe a sector-based approach would be best. Um, we modified that list as we went from the first iteration of the plan to the second. Uh, we were probably a year into the first plan when we figured out it was stupid to not have faith-based as a setting, you know, like 
where were we? And uh, we also added support uh, in, uh, in that second iteration. And some of you know there's a, a lot of interest now in support as, a, as an avenue for uh, <coughs> healthful physical activity. So uh, the plan, if it's anything, is comprehensive. So it's 50 strategies across those nine sectors. 264 tactics. I didn't put the number of objectives, but it's a lot of objectives under the tactics. Very detailed. Do we expect any one organization or person to deal with all that? Of course not. It's a, it's a Whitman sampler. It's go in, find something you love, pick it up, and run with it. Right. So, it, 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 but it's, there's a lot there. Um, so. I don't have time to talk about uh, 250 strategies and tactics, so I'm just going to pull out 10 of them that I think are really important. And you know, one of the challenges with physical activity is it's a complex behavior. Right? People do it in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different places, for a lot of different reasons, and that means promoting it, getting people to do more of it, is also complicated, right? So, you know, <laughs> as, as much as I wish, you know, we could learn some magic bullets, probably like the tobacco people did, you know, it took a long time to learn them, but, you know, we finally found, you know, two, three, four really good tobacco control strategies, right? They, they served us pretty well. Uh, I don't think that's going to work with physical activity. I think it's just too complex a behavior. But I think if we could manage to do most of the ones I'm going to mention here, I think it would make a difference. Uh, one is we got to start taking this seriously. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't want to be rude, but we're not. And, and I don't say that to demean anybody at CDC and the physical activity branch. They're great friends and colleagues, and they're doing everything they can. But you know, there's a reason why we got our arms around tobacco in this society, and that is we did Surgeon General's report on smoking and health every year, year after year after year, and we created you know an office on smoking and health, and we invested in it, and we kept going even though we weren't making any progress for a long time, and eventually that curve you know started to drop. So I think we need something like that. Uh, within the federal public health system for physical activity. And, and so, you know, take this as a, a little bit conceptual, but an office of physical activity and health resource more or less the way uh, we, quite a long while ago, resourced uh, the office on smoking and health. We've got to get this up. Now, let me say, do I think there will ever be enough federal money invested in physical activity to solve the problem? Hell no. Of course not. But we've got to have leadership. Okay? We've, we've got you know, to have somebody at the controls that, that, that can lead this effort, and uh, we, we need a better investment in, in the federal public health system. Another overarching strategy in the plan is establish a robust and comprehensive surveillance system. You know, sort of the principle in public health that um, you know you, you deal with the things you monitor, right? And we've got a we've got a Swiss cheese approach to surveillance for physical activity. We, we've got some, we've got some things that we monitor. Uh, there's a lot of things we don't monitor, and and uh, you know we, we would be in a better position if uh, you know if we did have a more robust surveillance system for monitoring not just personal physical activity behavior. But where we are with with uh, programs and initiatives and efforts to, uh, uh, to to promote physical activity, um, and there's a start. Chris knows, right? You know, with, through the National Academies group that we've been involved in, we've been a series of projects that uh, have at least laid out a roadmap for um, you know, how we could have a more robust surveillance system around physical activity in the U.S. Another overarching strategy is launch a national physical activity campaign. So you might be thinking, haven't we done that? No. <laughs> okay. No, we haven't done it. All right. We've danced around it a little bit here and there. 
But um, you know, there's reason to believe that, that a very well-crafted campaign could have an impact. Now, that, in my view, would not be a campaign that you know advertises what the guideline is or harangues people about how important it is to get off the couch and so on. It would be focused on how real people in our society can successfully manage physical and, and do manage physical activity behavior. So that's my bias. Uh, we do have some history of success. I'm going to bet there are some people in the room who were the right age <laughs> when the Verb campaign came out. So if you were a tween about 15 years ago, uh, you were targeted by the Verb campaign, which was funded by a going away gift to a retiring congressperson. Uh, he said, they asked him, what would you like? He said, well, I'd like to fund a, 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 a Child Health Initiative. The money got shipped to CDC. It took them about two years to figure out what to spend it on. They decided to spend it on a camp public communication campaign around physical activity. Uh, I happened to be on a, a sort of a distal advisory evaluation committee. I remember thinking two things. God, this is great. Number two, not a snowball's chance in hell that it's going to do anything. <laughs> well, it did. <laughs> They, they contrived, a, I thought, a very clever evaluation scheme, and they're pretty strong evidence that it worked. Uh, and and uh, so I think I think the methodology is out there for us to do this and do it do it effectively. So now some sector-based steps that I think would be important. I think in the education sector, um, we we need to invest nationally in getting the comprehensive school physical activity model in place. PE is important, um, but it alone is not going to solve the problem. Okay, So we've got to think more creatively about uh, how kids can be physically active while they're in school. They're in school a lot. It's essentially the work site for kids. Right? They're there a lot of hours for a lot of years. And um, you know, there's, there's the momentum around this. Um, not enough, but uh, this basically says kids ought to be active not only in PE, not only during recess, but in the classroom, with classroom exercise breaks, with physically active teaching learning strategies. They should be active transport to and from school in the morning and after school. The school environment ought to be a physically active place for kids. In public health, we need uh, a more robust system. We need cross-sectional partnerships and coalitions you know, that's it. You know, I'm, I'm uh, I sort of adopted public health. I wasn't trained in public health. Never had a course in public health in my life. But I've worked in the school of public health for a long time, and I guess by sort of osmosis or something, I, you know, I've sort of become a true believer. You know, what I, what I think public health does best is bring groups together, bring people together, mobilize effort, um, and uh, we just need to do more and better with that around the physical activity in public health issues. And you know, there's some, you know, if, if all you do these days is focus on what's the federal government doing, you can get pretty damn depressed pretty quickly, right? It's very hard to get anything through Congress, and it's very hard to get the agencies to really do something that's innovative. But I'll tell you, if you focus on the communities in this country, there is fabulous stuff going on. It is cool. And, you know, just an example is uh, the Active Living Council of San Antonio. Just pull their website up and see what they got going on. Uh, and, and it's not alone. There are other, other places that are doing great things. In healthcare, uh, you know, we need, we need consistent physical activity assessment, advice, and promotion. And uh, some of you know that the American College of Sports Medicine has had an exercise as medicine initiative to promote this for a long time, making progress. And uh, <coughs> this is one I particularly like. And uh, Mark Fenton, if were he able to be here, Mark's a tough adjunct. <laughs> I heard from him the other day. <laughs> and uh, he would be proud of me for including this one on my short list, I think. But uh, so in the transportation, land use, and community design sector of the national plan, there's a call for community planners to integrate active design principles into land use, transportation, community 
All right, so you know if, if somebody's going to build a big building somewhere now, they, they are usually required to do an environmental impact assessment, right? So what this is about, do the same thing for physical activity, right? Institutionalize it. So if you're going to build something, uh, think about what that's going to mean for people's physical activity as a result of that. So, you know, are you going to put a highway right down the middle of a neighborhood so that it can't, you know, people can't go from one side to the other? What's the nature of the building? Is it going to have a staircase that anybody would ever want to have anything to do with? Or is it just going to be elevators? So, I'd love to see this one get institutionalized. In the recreation, fitness, and parks category, communities should develop new and enhance existing community recreation, fitness, and park programs. I'm going to familiar with the situation here in Boston. Uh, we got a lot of you know, lousy rec programs, okay? And, and, you know, we could just do better, okay? We really could be more creative, and I'm speaking nationally here because there are some wonderful programs out there. Uh, you know, there are a lot of parks. Okay? We've got a zillion parks in this country. Not, not very many people live very far from a park in this country. But we've got a lot of undeveloped parks that there's not really much there, and sometimes they're dirty and unsafe and so on. So we need to do better with the resources we're already paying for. You know, the rec centers and the rec programs can be, can be better than they are. And there are initiatives out there to, to deal with that. And in the business and industry category, uh, this is an area where there has been progress, uh, but we, we, we do have to... to uh, provide employees with opportunities and incentives to adopt and maintain a physically active lifestyle. And I'm glad that there's some planning going on around this. CDC has, a, I think, quite a nice program developed. And in the sport category, uh, I, I think we've got to think more about uh, all these people that are in sport situations and yet not getting very much physical activity. There, there are ways of having uh, kids and adults uh, who are who are associated with sport organizations a lot more active than they tend to be. And we do have a, a, an initiative right now, Project Play, supported by the Aspen Institute, that is focused on uh, enriching the youth sport experience in this country. So where does that take us? Well, I've said activities, the complex behavior, We've got to attack it from a lot of different levels in, in our society, and I'm not expecting anybody in this room to do them all, right? But you can do something, okay? You, you can do something, all right? And, and what I think it is, is pick a setting, whatever appeals to you, okay? It could be the elementary school in your neighborhood. It could be the county council. It could be your legislator in Congress. It, it could be your work site. It could be you know, any setting, your church, wherever, wherever you know, you're engaged. Pick, pick a setting. Select from the evidence-based strategies in the national plan. We've tried to do your homework for you, okay? We've tried to lay out, here's the menu, okay? These things have been shown to, to be efficacious. Um, pick from them and then work to implement them and add for, advocate for them uh, in, in that setting and lead the thing we learn over and over again when we get out into communities and, and, and find these places where great stuff's going on, over and over again, it's a, it's a leader. Somebody stepped up and said, God, I'm going to make this happen. And it does, you know. So don't be shy. <laughs> get out there and, uh, and lead. So thank you all very much for having me on. <laughs> everyone. We have uh, about five minutes for questions. Um, Hans and I have microphones, so if anyone have, has a question, uh, raise your hand and we'll come and visit. I don't mind arguing, so you don't have to agree with everything I said. I can start us off. Thank you so much. That was an excellent talk. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, what you were saying with sort of the political will um, and how things get done in Washington around the physical activity guidelines. So we have them in 2008, had a 10-year gap, 2018. What, what 
was motivating to become the 2018? Was that the Obama administration? And what, what's it going to take from this point forward? And, and what can we do as scientists, as practitioners, and as advocates? Yeah, I, um, honestly, I see the physical activity public health community as, as young and developing. <laughs> so if you look at public health um, fields that are, that are advanced, what you see is there's a scientific community over here that's doing the research, that's sort of feeding the evidence, you know, into the system. And then you've got policy developers that sort of take that science and they package it, right, in ways that, that can be uh, implemented, you know, through processes in, in uh, government or, you know, in the private sector. And then third, you've got advocates. You've got people that, you know, walk the halls, pound on the doors, talk to the people, get in their face, and, and you know, move these initiatives forward. So the physical activity in public health field uh, is, is developing. It certainly has developed a lot over the last few decades, <clears throat> but we still don't have um, the resources and, and, and sort of system in place to be as effective as I think we need to be with policy development, and we certainly are not as effective as I think we need to be at advocating for uh, important initiatives. So, progress, you know, I have to pep myself up every now and then. I mean, God knows we're far ahead of where we used to be, and, and I, I think we should all feel good about that, uh, but we can't get complacent because this stuff isn't going to just fall out of the sky. You know, if we want policies to change, you know, we, we got to package these ideas in effective ways and then advocate for them. Okay. So I've been in the room, and in, in full disclosure, I've been in the room with Russ for decades with him standing up and saying, don't forget physical activity <laughs> in a room full of nutrition people when he was the only physical activity person. But now this looks I mean, I think there have been some advantages from learning from our mistakes. But um, my question is, is anybody talking about, it seems like we've had an amicable, if not divorce, separation to get our tasks done. Mm -hmm. Is anybody working on the fact that the two behaviors, eating and physical activity, go together? And certainly I'm thinking in public schools, Issues around the two really, uh, it's unnatural to be divorced. Yeah, um, I think about that a lot. Oh, uh, good. Uh, you know, it, it, the way I process it sometimes is, uh, and we're, we're probably not the best people to do it, but somehow you have to try and put yourself on the other side, right? The, the, you know, the person in the public is trying to figure out what to worry about, what to act on, and so on. And I, I mean, I, I, I find a lot. If you start talking to somebody about physical activity, they want to talk about diet. If you start talking to them about diet, they want to talk about physical. So whether we connect these two fields or not, the public does. Okay, I think it's almost reflexive that people sort of understand that the two relate to one another. Um, you know, in, in, in academia, there's been a lot of change. And, and I do think we are finding a lot more effective integration between the, the, the sort of nutrition and physical activity communities <coughs> uh, in, in, in academic settings than, than certainly was true a few decades ago. In public health, uh, it's all over the map. You know, we've, we've recently cataloged uh, state-level physical activity plans in the U.S across all the states, there are a lot of them, most of them are embedded in chronic disease, uh, non-communicable disease, or obesity plans. Well, if, if, they're, if they're in that environment, then they're clearly paired with a new, you know, nutrition analog, right? So sometimes in public health, I think they get pulled together fairly well. Um, um, from a policy standpoint, from a policy development or a policy advocacy standpoint, I, 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 don't, I don't really think we work together that much or that effectively. 
you know, I, I, um, <coughs> and Gene knows what I think. Uh, you know, there, there, there's a huge infrastructure in this country to support um, nutrition and, and dietary health. And uh, the physical activity field doesn't have nearly that. Okay. I mean, it, it's the, the, the federal investment in physical activity is, is minuscule. I mean, the real, the real money for physical activity is, is at the community level, where you know, we've got schools and rec centers and parks and you know programs and that sort of thing. So that, that's where the real investment in physical activity is in this country, uh, not really at the federal level. Um, so I, I wasn't sure I was going to mention this, but um, so I, I, I spent a lot of time talking about the National Physical Activity Plan and the Alliance. We're, we're currently engaged in discussions with two other organizations about merging. One is the National Coalition on Promoting Physical Activity, which really has been an advocacy group, and the National Physical Activity Society, which really is a professional public health, physical activity, public health organization. Uh, it's not done yet. Uh, their votes are going to be taken sometime in the next month or so, but there's a pretty good chance that those three organizations are going to merge. And this was all catalyzed by some leadership from the American Heart Association with a lot of discussion about how the nutrition world is done better by you know, sort of coming together, uh, creating coalitions that have been more impactful uh, in, in the advocacy world. We've been pretty fractionated. In, in physical activity. Well, we're at the end of time. Um, let's thank Dr. Pate. Thank you very much. Uh, the students who are joining for lunch, you can come uh, up to the front. And remember, there is a class that comes in afterwards. So let's make that transition quickly.